Good evening, everybody. For those who don't know me, my name's Phil Brown. I'm the uh, High Performance Manager for Basketball ACT. Um, welcome to, to the first of four um, coaching forums. Um, and uh, firstly, just thank you for giving up your time um, to on a Thursday evening to to um, to jump on on online for this uh, first presentation on running an effective training session. Um, right I think everybody's on mute. Yeah, if you're not, if you could go on mute, that would be great oh, uh, because we've got around 50 or 60 coaches joining us tonight. So um, that'll help a little bit. Um, I've just got a bit of a, a, a presentation for the first part of um, the pre first part of the, the hour, and then um, I want to hopefully allow times there for questions. So if you um, use the uh, hand up icon, and uh, we'll go through that and answer any questions that coaches have. So if you can just hang on to those questions till um, uh, to the end of the, the presentation and so on there. Um, okay, we'll make a start. Um, we've got a, a range of coaches, uh, some I know through the high performance programs who co coach in our programs. Uh, and, and we've also got a, a lot of club coaches, which is just really terrific. So thank you again for giving up your time tonight to, to join us for this. Hopefully it's beneficial. Um, obviously we're pitching this at a wide range of different um, experience uh, levels. So uh, hopefully there's something in it for everybody. So we'll uh, make a start um, here. So just a few things to start with that uh, when we're talking about planning. So the first thing is um, always important to have a plan, um, whether that's, you know, a written down plan um, or it's written you know, on the back of a serviette at lunchtime or you use your iPhone to, to write out a, a, a practice plan or a training plan for that, uh, that evening's training, whatever it is, you, you've got to have have some thoughts down on uh, so it's a you know you've planned your practice out which we'll go through and so on there um, again there with some of the planning considerations around the time and space uh, that you've got you know I know we've got coaches here that have an hour um, once a week with their players they have half a court um, so one basket so you know you've got a um, obviously consider what resources you've got available there. Um, the other thing is, the next thing is just the players, uh, physical and psychological maturity. Um, obviously, if you're dealing with young kids or, or players with limited experience in, the, in, the, in basketball, then you've obviously got to plan your session to meet their needs and, and, and make sure it's not too advanced and uh, where they're discouraged or it's, they're just not ready for some of the the things you'd like to throw at them in practice. So understanding their, you know, their, their capabilities and their experience level um, and their, you know, just their um, physical maturity as well is important there. Um, again, previous experience and their skill set, you know, it's no good doing advanced uh, uh, techniques that you've picked up from the NBA or the WNBA uh, from last weekend's games and, and your players don't have a, the foundation skill set. So that's always important that, you know, fundamentals are the uh, absolutely critical part um, in, for junior coaches, which is most of the coaches on this forum, um, that should uh, make up a significant proportion of your training sessions um, is skill development and reinforcement of uh, skills and refining of skills. Um, other considerations are, are around the number of players. I know um, players here, uh, uh, sorry, coaches here may have, you know, six or seven players uh, at practice, so you don't don't even have ten to be able to scrimmage, you know, there. So you've you've got to uh, have a, a reasonable understanding of how many players that you expect to to, to roll up to practice, whether that's five or six or eight. Um, and making sure that you can, um, you know, tweak your practice plan if you've got less numbers than you might have anticipated. Um, time of, uh, 
obviously basketball. So I would encourage you to to um, you know at, at the club level and and even at the high performance level, we get our players to bring their own basketball to to trainings. Uh, there, the more more balls we got, the better. The more activities we can do, uh, the more we got uh, got a ball in everybody's hands, and they're they're working on their their dribbling and shooting and layups and and so on there. If you've got you know access to cones or you can get some cones, you only need half a dozen cones. Um, obviously, that's advantageous for dribbling drills and um, as part of your warm up and so on there. Um, if you've got a clock, we well, there we got access to a, 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 a clock for your drills. That's advantageous as well. Of course, you can use your phone. Um, if you've got side baskets as well as end baskets at the gym that you're training at. Obviously, try and use those um, wherever you can with with as many drills. Um, the time of season is important. Obviously, pre-season is very different from leading into finals, so um, that's going to dictate the type of practice or the type of training uh, plan you're going to design uh, there. So, um, you know, obviously, pre-season there's going to be a lot of reinforcement of fundamentals, a lot of drilling type activities, conditioning, fitness. Uh, there and and then obviously leading into finals at the other extreme is you know is refining if you're running any set plays or your offensive system uh, um, you know refining your defensive scout for the finals you know those type of things become more relevant for the type of training plan that you're going to put together um, things through the season is obviously identifying weaknesses this is a big one I think is be able to to have two or three things coming out of every game that you've identified as you know key areas that you need to address at practice uh, or at training um, you know in, in the coming week you know there so making sure that you just don't uh, you know forget the the areas that were uh, not done well uh, during the game so if you've had a lot of turnovers um, and you've identified most of them were passing turnovers then you want to address that, you know, was it what type of passes, what type of situations in the game resulted in those passing turnovers? Was it looking at in fast break where the kids are, um, are looking at kick ahead passes up the floor uh, there where we just threw, you know, uh, cross court passes into the defence or was it uh, off dribble penetration in the half court in you know, penetration and, and dish out to shooters where a lot of the turnovers were happening, um, you know, dribbling too deep and uh, into the defence and then trying to make a pass when you've got two or three defenders on you is, is, is always challenging. Or is it, you know, most of our passing errors came from passing to the low post uh, there. So trying to ident identify weaknesses from the previous game um, uh, is is important and um, and then be able to to reinforce and make time in your training plan to to address those areas. You know, more so at the higher levels, you want to you know understand the opponents you're going to play coming up on the weekend and, and um, prepare your team to play against that team. So you can still do that at every level, of course. If you know you're going to be playing against a an opponent that is very quick, um, like to fast break a lot, then you might, you know, you you might want to address um, defensive transition, making sure that we've got safety, we've got basket uh, protection, we're finding the ball early, we're spreading the floor and matching up with a sense of urgency, so we can work on that with some drills at practice. So some of the things there that are important in before you even put pen to paper. Uh, there is to, to to understand you know those things and um, to be able to set a good good training plan up. Things that you know I think at every level that you would have to varying degrees, um, whether we're talking junior level or we're talking uh, high performance senior high performance, is obviously these sort of checklist, uh, some sort of warm up um, there. You know at the younger levels or even. At the higher levels, we want to utilise the available time. So if I've only got an hour once a week with my group, my club team, then I would try and get them 15, you know, 10 to 15 minutes earlier to training uh, and warm up on the baseline or on the sideline if there's space permitting and there so we're not wasting 
uh, our one hour um, doing a warm up and and a stretch. Let's let's get ball in their hands. Let's get them active. Let's let's go for that one hour of that I've got with the kids and the kids are there to to dribble, pass, shoot, and play basketball and and so on there. And we can do our warm up prior and do our our stretches at the end of practice or end of training on the sideline or or by the side of the court. Um, particularly for juniors, but even, you know, some, some uh, top-up work, I call it, with senior players um, that, are, that are, you know, proficient and experienced players. But some ball work is important. Get ball familiarity for young kids is really important. So, you know, coaches may be familiar with the, the Pete Maravich ball handling, you know, so you've got your body wraps and your figure eights and your dribbling drills. You can do those you know, dynamic fashion or stationary. So these type of things can actually be done before you get on the court uh, on the sidelines. So again, you know, training smart uh, there, but, you know, ball handling and that's going to help the kids passing, dribbling, shooting, if they're comfortable with the ball, with the basketball in their hands. Um, then some dribbling activities uh, there, whether that's you know, one on zero through the cones or it's, you know, there's a, a million different dribbling activities that you can do uh, out there. Passing, pivoting. So pivoting is one of the foundation uh, skills of our sport. If you can't uh, stop, so either utilising a jump stop or a stride stop uh, and then be able to pivot, uh, both forward pivot and reverse pivot on, on, on either foot, um, it's hard to build skill uh, on that if they can't do that foundation skill of stopping and pivoting. So there needs to be, particularly with young kids um, uh, there, there needs to be some reinforcement of correct pivoting and the, and the skills or the technique that goes with these activities to do them, to do them well. Um, passing is probably, in my view, you know, one of the most under taught skills uh, in the sport, you know, there we sort of assume kids can pass when in fact they they, they don't pass the well, the ball well in non-preferred hand. So, you know, with dribbling, passing and layups, they need to be proficient both sides of the body. So right hand and left hand uh, there. So you need to commit time with the kids to develop those skills. Uh, shooting is, is, is the premium skill of our of our sport uh, there so you again you know most kids will, will do will, will commit time to to working on their shooting and stuff but that needs to be incorporated in uh, in every practice and we probably as a generalized comment we don't do enough shooting uh, in Australia compared to a lot of other countries around the world it's um it's it's as I say the premium skill that we need to it's we need to spend time on that, you know, both layups and, and perimeter shooting with that. Um, and there's different, um, you know, drills and activities you can do. And, and in fact, that's the, the topic I'm proposing to do next Thursday is shooting. Um, and and um, so we can cover that next week. Um, building up, you know, progressing your practices into individual, some one-on-one should be in every practice, whether it's for three minutes or for you know 33 minutes, there needs to be one on one. That's the core of the game: is your ability offensively to break down your defender, uh, whether that's off um, you know ball fakes, foot fakes, or a combination thereof, or off the live dribble of breaking down your defender. Um, so one on one skills are important. So conversely, defensively, uh, your ability to defend the ball is really really important. So in our sport. There's different scenarios, you know, uh, containment of, uh, of of the offensive player with the dribble, closing out and containing, defending flash cuts, defending in the low post, or one-on-one type situations that need to be, again, reinforced in trainings uh, if to varying degrees. There should be some one-on-one -on -one in every practice um, there. And then team defence, obviously, you know, I would encourage, uh, particularly in the junior levels and um, and even in the senior levels, you know, man-to-man defence and skills and the team techniques that go with to becoming a, a, a proficient team defensively, playing man-to-man. -man. Rebounding is a, is a core component of 
basketball, you know, many coaches would say the, uh, which is backed up by the, you know, the analytics around statistics is a team that wins the rebounds, generally wins most basketball games. So, you know, it's probably, again, something that needs to be done um, uh, and reinforced in every activity is rebounding the ball, second efforts, whether we're talking offensively or defensive rebounding. Small side games are a great way to teach the game. Three on three, four on four, two on two. There's a, a ton of things that you can do in that. Um, the good, the great things about small sided games as a coach is that the kids get lots of touches. You know, they've got to defend all, you know, particularly out of three on three, you basically defend all the actions that an offensive team can throw at you with balls, on ball screens, off ball screens, pass and cut, uh, dribble penetration, you know, just everything can be done uh, in three on three largely and stuff. And, and so the kids are very engaged, they're involved, they're not standing around. So I would encourage you to do a lot of stuff around two on two, three on three, and that's a great progression out of the one on one. Obviously the game's five and five, so ideally, you know, you, you, you want to incorporate uh, to varying degrees in terms of how much time you can, can commit into five on five. You know, do some, you know, kids love to play. It's usually the first thing they're probably going to ask you, you know, when do we get to play? <laughs> so, um, you know, when, when we've got the, you know, we need to find a balance between, you know, uh, drilling the fundamentals and reinforcing correct execution of the fundamentals. But we ultimately the game's five on five. And so, you know, if you've got those numbers and you can play five and five at the, towards the end of practice, um, or you might even start practice that way after your warm up, you know, just play a three minute uh, five and five games, again, numbers permitting. Um, so scrimmaging is, is part of it. And it's just trying to find a balance uh, there around, you know, as I say, the, the, the dribbling, the, the foundation skills and, and, uh, and getting some gameplay done. So it's a good lead into um, our principles for designing an effective training, uh, or sorry, principles for designing effective training conditions. So I'll just sort of cover these off. Um, most of them are pretty uh, sort of common sense, um, but often, you know, we all fall um, into some of the mistakes by not incorporating some of these things when we plan our practices or execute our trainings with the kid, with our players. Um, you know, Wherever possible, you know, practice conditions should make use of the available facilities and equipment. You know, one of the I've seen it where I've walked past uh, trainings and and there's you know been one ball being used and there's ten kids in a line doing right hand layups and there's you know nine basketballs lying against the wall um, and two side baskets not being used. You know, generally you know where you're going to train on a regular basis know what the, the environment is that you're going into. Do you have side baskets? Get the kids to bring their own basketball. Ideally, you've got some basketballs as well because invariably someone will forget to bring their basketball. Um, use what you've got, you know, use the facilities. If you don't have cones, are there chairs or garbage bins that you can put out on the court to dribble that round? Uh, do your dribbling drills with the kids around those garbage bins. You know, be creative about using what you've got around you. Um, you know, make sure you 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 allot enough time for the kids to make improvements. You know, if you're not going to to reinforce, for example, non-preferred hand dribbling um, and provide opportunities for the kids to work on, in most cases, left hand dribbling then they're not getting enough practice time on that weakness and stuff. So we've really got to make sure, you know, we've got that responsibility to make sure that they're developing their non-preferred hand skills and we're spending extra time. I call it the two thirds, one third. So most kids are, you know, are pretty proficient on their right hand dribbling and right hand layups. But as soon as you, you ask them to do dribble left hand and make a left hand, a correct left hand layup, off the right foot and shoot it with their left hand, they're found wanting. So we, we, we have to encourage that and reinforce that, provide enough time for the kids to get practice of that. Understanding it's 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 a progress. They're not going to get better just in five minutes or in one training. It's going to be a progress over a, over a significant period of time. Um, 
you know, specificity is really important. You know, the kids are there for basketball. Uh, you know, they're not really there to play, you know, a crossover Red Rover or do some other calisthenics or some other, um, you know, physical activity. You know, they're there for basketball. So, you know, get them dribbling, get them shooting, get them passing, you know, get them tired, <laughs> you know, work them, you know, there. So it's important that we're working on our – on on the things that relate to the basketball whenever possible there. Um, principle number four is, is, is just generally just the logical, you know, progression of activities in your training session. You know, there it just doesn't make sense to start doing, you know, in the middle of July in Canberra, starting with, you know, uh, conditioning, doing suicides and sprints when they haven't warmed up appropriately. And, um, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So same thing, starting with, uh, you know, complex team activities like four and four things where we haven't really got them, you know, dribbling and passing and ball familiarity and, and getting a feel for it. So it just sort of makes sense to, to do some warm-up activities. I would encourage you with the limited time that we all have is to do your warm-up activities with a ball in their hands. So start them dribbling, doing pairs passing on the move, you know, so we're warming up the core temperature. They're, they're passing and dribbling and making layups and, you know, you, you're into it uh, doing some of those multi-combination um, type activities and stuff. And there's a logical uh, uh, transition or progression of drills through practice. Principle five is, you know, the, invariably, because we're teachers uh, first and coaches second, is when we're teaching skills that you can get into a lot of one-on-zero stuff. And one-on-zero definitely has a place when we can isolate a certain activity and we'll talk in, in um, you know, around sh developing sh uh, a correct shooting technique next week. But it's the same thing with dribbling and passing, where we can just simplify the actual skill, isolate the skill. Then clearly one on zero is is a terrific way, you know. The, the, and then we can layer it as kids, as the players get more proficient, they get better. Then we can start to add, you know, more uh, complexity to the dribbling drill you know, by adding a defender or adding another ball. So you're doing two ball dribbling or combination drills where you dribble it and you pass it and you catch it back. So you've got to catch and dribble again into a layup. So they're sort of combo type activities are really good for teaching. Um, but one of the traps um, is to get caught in a lot of one on zero, two on zero. So two offense, no defense. Five on zero. That's the, you know, a necessary evil at the higher levels to to an extent where we do five on zero to work through our set plays and our out of bounds plays. But as we know, again, the game is not five on zero. It's five on five. So if we pull that back to one on zero. We need to, to make when kids. We need to the kids want to compete. You know, they want to play. They want to play against the defender in most cases. So. You know, we've got to find a balance with the, the on zero. Principle number six, a uh, really important one, I, in, uh, I believe, is creating a really a positive environment where the kids in particular, but even senior players for that, for that matter, that it's, they want to come to training. They look forward to training. They're excited about coming to training because they're going to learn new skills. They've, they're going to have, they're going to be with their mates in training, they're going to be challenged at training through competitive drills and uh, competitive uh, activities, uh, fitness, you know, and, and so on there. So that's important there. But we also want to create an environment as coaches where you're allowed to make mistakes. We're not going to jump on mistakes. That's how you get better. You know, there's not uh, you know, failure, then you're not getting better. You know, if you're not making mistakes, then you're probably, you know, you're not going hard enough. You're not going at game speed. So we need to to not be afraid to, to firstly challenge players to do things correctly and do things at pace, at game speed. But when they're missing layups and making mistakes, 
you know, it, that's that's a chance to learn and and generally if they're executing correctly, over the period of time, errors will come down, proficiency will go up. So we want an environment where the kids know they're not afraid to try things. Uh, you know, I use the phrase, be bold, be brave. You know, there, don't back yourself, don't try things because that's how you're going to get better. You're not going to be perfect, far from it. You're going to make mistakes and that's how you're going to get better. Um, principle number eight is, is when you're learning something, don't over, you know, uh, don't labour on it. You know, if it's something like left-hand layups where a lot of kids are just, it's hard. When you're learning something that's really foreign, um, and it's uncomfortable. It's it's challenging mentally as well as physically and stuff to to get that footwork of um, with the left hand layup to go left right and extend to the basket and shoot it with your left hand off your right foot is not easy. You know for most kids. So we want to do little chunks. You know there and and do it for six or seven minutes and move on to something. And maybe the next activity is something where they can feel uh, success, where they can experience success. So it's something they've done previously. We know, you know, you know they can do it pretty well. And so you can coach on the run. They've just had a, a pretty intense learning block and an opportunity to, to practice left-hand layups. Let's break it up. Let's move on into a, a, a an upbeat or up tempo type of activity to keep it moving and get back the game, uh, the, 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 the tempo of training. Um, and we'll probably come back to that one. Um, principle number nine is, you know, probably a fault and, and probably all of us have been guilty at some stage is just, just um, doing something for way too long, you know, and I've seen this, uh, it's, a, it's a common mistake where you see kids doing something and 15 minutes later, they're doing the same activity um, and there's no change up and it's it's starting to lose its intensity. It's starting to lose 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 its um, effectiveness. You know, you so so be be cognizant of keeping things depending on the activity. Some activities can be two minutes. You know, I, I referred to the marriage ball handling stuff. Uh, you know, some of those things can be two or three minutes. And then, bang, we're moving on to something else. You know, a, a passing drill can be three minutes, four minutes, move on to the next dribbling drill. You know, and if it's, if it's a dribbling drill that they, they're familiar with, you don't have to teach a lot. Like, you don't have to set the drill up because the kids know the drill. So let's, let's get into it. Let's go. Three, four minutes of greatness um, in the dribbling drill. Let's move on. So, you know, generally around that sort of, you know, I've got eight to ten minutes you know, their maximum, you know, most activities there. So just be cognizant of that, of, you know, and of course you can go the other way where you try and cover too much, you know, at practice, like you have too many activities and you're trying to squeeze in, you know, 12 activities in 60 minutes. You've got one hour. Yeah, you know, maybe that's not enough repetition. You know, there you're moving too quickly. So kids have got to have a chance to, to practice, to have repetitions, uh, there. So particularly when it's new things, they need to have uh, appropriate trial and, error, trial and error experience. It's something they have to feel it, you know, what does this feel like to do this, you know, there. So they need to have more than, you know, three or four reps or goes at something. They need to have more of that. So just be, again, aware of that. The final principle is it doesn't matter if you're in a senior pro environment, high performance pro environment, or you're coaching division five in under 12s, it should be a really you know fun environment. You should have fun. The players definitely need to be having fun, um, learning, competing, fitness, the social aspects that come with it. Um, I think that's really important. There's nothing worse than you know leaving you know training and you know, kids, no one's had fun or it's just been a slog or it's, you know, there, there'll be the natural ups and downs and trainings and so on, but um, it's challenging, particularly when you've got limited time. You know, if you've got, you know, eight kids, one hour on half a court, you've got to be really organised in that for your training each week. And that's easier said than done, I know. Um, other considerations, 
um, there is just creating it. I would, these are handy home hints or coaching 101. If I'm in coaching club land, I've only got an hour or an hour and a half. Uh, there is just have your core set of drills, you know, maybe 10 drills uh, that, that cover all the aspects uh, of the game. Um, and clearly the fundamentals are important and, and some of the team concepts. And, and so that you're not spending, wasting time doing a lot of work, uh, a lot of teaching on drills, introducing a drill. This is the drill. You know, that's really not what the outcome is. It's about what the players are getting out of that drill or that activity. So why reinvent the wheel when I've I can take a drill or an activity my team already knows and I layer it. So what I mean by these, I'll, as they become proficient, I layer another level of complexity. I add another ball into the activity. You know, I, I um, um, you know, I add cones into the activity. So they've got to dribble around the cones before they make the layup. I add a defender or or they've got to uh, make so many successful layups in two minutes. So I add, I challenge them in different ways rather than just a whole bunch of different drills and stuff there. Um, yeah, if you've only got half a court or, you, or even, you know, a, a full court, you've, you've got to make sure that there's a conditioning element. You know, our game isn't... Uh, uh, in the half court, it's five and five, it's full court, there's four 10 minute quarters or four eight minute quarters, whatever the case might be at the level you coach. You need to incorporate within your trainings an appropriate amount of conditioning. Again, I would encourage you to do as much conditioning with the ball in the hands. A, it's more fun, B, it's smarter because the kids are still dribbling and passing and catching and going full court. So your transition drills, you know, your traditional three-man weaves up and down. Work. So they're working on the skills, but they're also working on their conditioning at the same time there. So, you know, that's part of the specificity of the sport rather than just doing running for 20 minutes or 15 minutes or something and doing line runs or suicides you know, if you're going to do something like that, make them dribble it when they're doing their suicide with their non-preferred hand. So if you're going to say, okay, we've got a suicide under 40 seconds, but you're going to dribble the ball on your non-preferred hand. So for most kids, obviously left hand. So, you know, learning how to be smart about how you structure your trainings and stuff and conditioning elements. So sort of transitioning into the coaching element at trainings and stuff there so these are just sort of again i think 101 things but again it's um things to be really cognizant of when you plan your practice but also how you're going to deliver your training so first thing you've got to have a training plan either on your iphone or written down on the back of a survey at lunchtime you know there we're all busy you know it doesn't have to be you know typed out or anything like that but have a plan um if you've got a system coach or coaches, terrific. Use those coaches to help bring energy. So that's the first thing. You can have a, the best training plan out there, but if you don't bring life to it um, and bring the juice, as I call it, there's going to probably be disappointment both sides from you and also the players about the outcome of that training. So initially, it's up to us uh, as coaches to bring the juice to bring the energy hopefully then the kids will take over which they generally will uh at any level they will buy into it they will be off and going it doesn't mean during some teaching phases where it gets a bit flat because you're teaching some concepts or some skills it's a bit stop and start you can lose flow to training then you've got to read that and feel that and that's just part of the world we live in as coaches and you've got to ramp it up again and get the juice going again there um important this is a big one and it's a lot of it comes down to experience um and that can only happen just by trial and error as coaches um is finding a balance between teaching and coaching on the run um, I've seen, um, you know, and we can all be guilty of it. Uh, certainly I have been at times where it just becomes too much stop, start, correction, teaching, reinforcement, go again, stop, start, 
and you can really screw up a training very quickly um, if it's too much of that. So you've you've got to find a balance between re reinforcing the correct execution of the fundamentals, and that's the skill of coaching on the run as much as possible. So I don't stop the session. I'll take little Johnny to the side and and give little Johnny some some uh, one or two teaching points about dribbling and getting lower with your dribble, you're dribbling too high or you're dribbling with the, the palm of your hand rather than the, the pads of the hand and the fingers or, you know, you keep your head up, whatever the teaching points are, um, and get little Johnny to jump back in the line so I'm not disrupting the, the flow of the drill or activity and the other kids and so on and as an example there. But um, you got to, when you're planning your training sessions, you don't want to be over teaching where you've got one activity after another after another that is requiring a lot of teaching um, you've got to find flow with training and and spread your teaching blocks out with activities and keeping it upbeat uh, there and, and getting as much practice out of practice you know that you can there um, having your players move quickly is important basketball is not you know, cricket or golf or something where there's, you know, tennis where there's significant time between action, our game is not that. You know, there there, there are stoppages, obviously, free throws, timeouts, substitutions, but generally our game is going. Um, it, you know, so we, we've got to condition our players uh, for that. So we need to move quickly to drink breaks and back onto the floor to the next activity. We need to move quickly through our activity so we get more drill out of the drill. We get more repetitions. Uh, otherwise, that six, seven minutes is gone quickly and we haven't got enough out of it. We haven't had enough practice or repetitions of that. So having your players conditioned to move quickly, to run between activities is really, really important. And that's part of the conditioning your players mentally and physically, okay, there to the, man's, to the demands of our sport there. Um, and our game, like most sports, it's, it's a game of habits. So whether we talk about the ex execution of skills or the way we respond to, to uh, information on the floor, the way you recognise space, read the defence, react to um, a turnover, uh, react to a missed shot, um, you know, whatever the case is, it's a, it's a game of habits, how, you, how effectively you can react to the, to the situation is important. So we need to develop appropriate training habits. With the young kids, it's real, I call training habits 101. Commit to coming to practice. Team sport, come to every practice. Even if you're injured, assuming it's not a major injury, of course, come to practice. Okay, I'll give you a stationary skills program or I'll use you as a passer or you'll be engaged socially with your kids, with your teammates. We want you to be around practice. Be, be on time for practice. Run between activities. Make sure you've got a filled up drink bottle. Make sure you've got a pumped up basketball. Um, you know, be coachable. What I mean by that is learn to, to listen and to instruction and implement that in the drills. These are all basic stuff that kids need guidance of and reinforcement of and so on there. Um, making your players accountable, I, you know, again, I use the example if you're coaching under 12s Division 5, um, to me, you have a responsibility to, you know, yes, to have fun. Yes, those kids may not be that talented or, you know, want to aspire to be play for the Boomers or Opals. I understand that. But we want to teach life skills and things like working hard, uh, you know, training with uh, being a good teammate, um, second efforts, being on time, all these things are, are, are life skills. And so we want to reinforce those, those, um, those behaviours in our young players so they develop that personal responsibility, which will put, put them in a good position moving on as, into young adulthood. adulthood. Um, still on the coaching bit at trainings, you know, there is, is um, you know, you, you basically get what you, you tolerate um, as a coach. So if, if you're going to allow poor execution of the fundamentals, so kids shooting off the wrong foot, 
you know, shooting with the wrong hand on layups or passing across their body. That's a common error with with young kids or you know kids that are not um, proficient with their non-preferred hand skills. They pass across their body. Uh, there, um, you know, they you ask them to do a sprint, but they don't hit the lines. They 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 cut corners. You know, there all these you know the particularly the execution of the fundamentals. In my view, they need to be corrected. And the best time to correct those is right at the point when it's poor execution. Um, some of it's the trained eye for sure. So for the younger co or less experienced coaches, it takes time like anything to get good at. But over time, through practice, you know, you get better at the, the trained eye to, to, to look at uh, a kid executing uh, a layup uh, ineffectively or incorrectly and being able to identify what they did incorrectly. Well, they went off left-hand layup off their uh, left foot uh, there when they should be going off their right foot on a regulation left-hand uh, layup, then then to be able to correct that, you know, there and, and so on there. So same thing with passing, you know, shooting, all the skills. There's a correct way to execute the fundamental skills of the sport. And so it's upon us to make sure that we're not allowing uh, kids just to execute um, the skills poorly, you know, incorrectly there, because we're not we're doing them a disservice if we don't. And, and there's a balance with that. I'm not saying you're going to correct every single mistake. Try and learn how to coach on the run and, you know, there, but they need to be, uh, you know, held accountable, you know, for that there. Um Again, a common mistake, you know, I'm as guilty as anybody on this one, is trying to get it right, you know, in something there. So, you know, just trying to stay with an activity and get it right rather than saying, you know what, let's cut our losses. I'm going to make a note of this. I'm going to revisit this next week or in two days' time, depending on how often I get access to my team. And I'm going to just chip away, chip away at this in the coming weeks rather than just losing my flow of training because something's just woeful you know, there and, and trying to get it right. Um, you know, link the skill to the game. Again, you know, there it's it, it's important that we take the skills, the foundation skills, dribbling, pass, passing, shooting, defensive footwork and pivoting as a foundation skill of all, uh, of learning all skill is, is um, it's got to relate to the game, you know, there. So things have got to come to the game. We've got to – the kids have got to learn, the players have got to learn how to transfer the skills uh, into the game. So that's why the small-sided games and the five-and-five five scrimmages are important. They need to practice at transferring the skills uh, that we're reinforcing into game situations uh, there or at least – Three on three, two on two, things like that. There, so they have an opportunity to do that. Um, providing feedback is important. So I've obviously touched on coaching on the run. If you haven't, you know, giving kids individual feedback is really important. In the games um, is important. So when you're subbing kids out to be able to give them some feedback, it doesn't always need to necessarily be uh, around what they've done uh, incorrectly or poorly. You know, it can be also reinforcing what they've done well, you know, around, hey, just great efforts, really wait, great job running the floor, Johnny, you know, just fantastic efforts, rebounding, really good. Hey, just make sure that, you know, when you're going left, you dribble left, use your left hand when you're going left, you know, because you use that opportunity to give some, some relevant, specific technical feedback as well as general encouragement and positive reinforcement uh, around their efforts and stuff there. Um, yeah, and so sitting down, you know, getting a couple of your players to come to training early or to stay five minutes or 10 minutes back after training uh, or after the game and give them some individual feedback it is really, really beneficial uh, there. It's you get great traction out of everybody likes to hear their name called. Everybody likes to have individual feedback on what they're doing well and, and areas of improvement that they need to work on, you know, there. So I'd encourage you, you know, we do a lot through the team aspects, understandably. It's a team sport and we have limited time with our group, but try and find time to give individual feedback as well there. Um, I call it um, 
And also, a questioning is a great technique. Asking players, the group, what did we do well at training tonight? And listen to the feedback. That's good for us as coaches to, to hear and see where the kids are at. And that can sometimes be really surprising. Uh, kids are very intuitive. They're, they're smart um, there. And, and so they, they can come with some really good things around feedback for, for, for the whole group. You know, there some sometimes often the young kids need a little bit of encouragement, and you know, guided um, you know discovery on, on some of those areas. Uh, but you know, the more you ask questions, what did you do well tonight in the game? Where do we need to improve? You know, what do you think we need to to work on at practice on Monday night? You know, these type of things are really good questions because it also develops independence. It develops. Um, confidence within the playing group uh, there um, and and it also reinforces that we're a team and we respect the players opinions um, there and, and we want the players to learn to be um, assertive with their communication and having input into our team and into our team culture and contributing to our team culture um, the final thing there is just around I call it environment of certainty it's something that I believe in it's something that um, I suppose just comes with, um, I want the kids to come and be excited about coming to training. I want them to be upbeat, to grab a ball, get out, start shooting hoops. They want to be coached. They want to be challenged. They want to be leave practice saying, whoa, you know, that was tough. You know, I'm really tired, but we learned some new things. You know, we, we scrimmaged, we competed. So when I talk about competing, sometimes it's, it's against each other in, you know, one-on-one -on -one and three-on-three. -three. Other times it's competing against my drill. It's a shooting drill and I give them, okay, this is your target. You're going to make 60 baskets in, in five minutes. You know, there they know the drill and say, so you try and beat my drill. And they love that. You know, they, they, they're together, the group's together and off they go and, and, you know, and so on there. And I think those type of things... Kids want to compete. They want to be challenged and, and, and so on there. So in summary, um, have a plan, okay? Absolutely important. If you don't, if you're not organised and have some sort of plan on your phone or written down on the back of that serviette and you're umming and ahhing through training and asking the kids what do you want to do, the kids see through all that like in a heartbeat that, Coach is not organised. Coach hasn't got a plan. This is, in most cases, not what I signed up for. So it, that's our first responsibility as a coach is to have a plan, be organised. Um, ideally, start on time. I know we're all busy and we're coming from work and, you know, we're in really challenging times, particularly now. Uh, there you've got to, you know, you've, you, you've got to, Use the drive as you, to training to switch gears uh, there and, and have fun. You know, grab your training plan and and you, you might still be in your suit and tie, you know, because you're coming straight from work. But, you know, be on time, be organised, um, come in with the juice going and here we go. Here we go, kids. We're going to go an hour or an hour and a half of greatness here and, and have fun with them. You know, you can use humour through training, you know, the funny things happen at training. Everyone should have a laugh about those things, you know, and then we, you know, we move on and so on there. But um, really important, I, I know I've emphasised the plan bit, but I see at times, unfortunately, tr coaches that are not organised and don't have a plan and it, it becomes a just, a, you know, a, a not a great training session. Um, being on time, getting players involved, don't have long lines, you know, that's, that's the number one sin. Long line, one ball, kids at the end of the line are dacking the other kids. You know, it's it's ridiculous. You know, use all the baskets available. If you've got only one, then so be it. Then, you know, find ways that everybody is dribbling and passing and moving and passing against the wall 10 times. And, you know, nobody's sitting around. Nobody's standing at the end of a line. We're going to squeeze every second out of this one hour as I can as I can get more out of the drill as you can drill it play it so it's got to transfer into the game coach on the run 
you know, and it's messy. You know, the reality is it, it's messy and it can some trainings are just, you know, they are horrible, you know, not because of your fault or the, the training plan. You know, it can be for different reasons, you know, there. It's just, you know, the kids aren't switched on. It's exam time at school, you know, there. It's end of season. It's been a long year. You, could, you know, whatever the reason is, just get comfortable with a mess. Just, you know, persevere and because and, that's what we want them to do as well there. Okay, that took a little bit longer than I had hoped uh, there, so I apologise for that. But, um, yeah, so happy to, uh, to um, I'll, I'll just sort of go through if you've got, if you put your hand up, um, I'll try and zoom through here. Um, I'm not the most technological um, if proficient coach going around. I'm a little bit old school. But, um, yeah, I'm going to start. Nicole Johnson. Hey, Phil. Um, I just wanted to get some, see if you had any advice on when you um, have a large skill differential when you're planning a training session. So quite often the, like, the common advice is you change to the highest level, but particularly with the younger kids, um, you know, as you said before, the ones that aren't there, they get frustrated, they get bored, they get distracted. So yeah. what yeah what kind of advice do you have about that? Yeah, really challenging one at any, any level when there's such a range of experience and proficiency levels and and we, we whether we're talking about the best kid in your group or the or the you know the less experienced kid in your group then our responsibility is to coach those kids equally as well. So that means let's say I've got eight players in my club team, uh, little Johnny is you know sort of very inexperienced Keen as mustard, turns up every week, tries his hardest. I'm going to coach him just like the best kid in the group. But I've got to make sure that I'm not doing a disservice to my best, you know, my my more experienced kids. So I've got to make sure that I'm spending, you know, at times it might be a disproportion of time with little Johnny to make sure he feels comfortable within our group. So there's going to be a lot of encouragement to little Johnny about, hey, you're doing well. You are so much better than you were three weeks ago. Stay with it. Don't worry about the missed layout. You, the technique is correct. That, that'll that start to go, you know, there. Just keep at it. But I've got to, I've got to spread the love. I've got to be also work with the best kid. So with the best kid, I might say, look, I know you can make this layout. So now you've got to go around the cone, between the legs dribble, behind the backs dribble, and into your reverse layout. So the reverse layup is the same footwork, okay, there, um, except you're going to come through to the other side, as an example. So I'm so I'm going to sort of specialise and horses for courses a little bit, but it's in the same flow of the activity. Um, I hope that helped. Um, any other questions? Am I on the right track here? Um, If anybody's got something, because I might be just speak up, just just introduce yourself, and if you've got a question, Phil, if no one's going to ask something, can I ask just further to that? Yeah. So I understand what you're saying. So you're planning you're planning your training session, and um, this is not so much you know, not so much with the kind of HP kids, but definitely in the club, at club level, you know, the ones who you're saying, okay, Phil, that's great. You're going to go down between legs, two big steps reverse. And then you're saying to Shane, okay, Shane, you're just going to try shoot with that left hand. And you know, you know what Shane wants to do. You know what he wants to do. You know he wants to do the reverse. It's, um, you know, they just want to do, they don't want to feel like they're not keeping up. I've always been, found that a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it can be, and obviously the kid, you know, the kids are, as I said, very perceptive, so they know they, you know, little Johnny knows that he's he's not as good as the other kids, but you know, we don't want to discourage little Johnny and have him just lead the sport uh, there. So if if you know, and this is why we have different divisions, but clearly yeah. in some circumstances, the reality is we don't have a, another division for Johnny to go to where he can taste greater success 
and he's playing at a level that suits him at this point in time. Um, so we've got to encourage Johnny. We've got to make sure we're putting him into games where he can have success, not putting players into into games or in situations where they're going to fail. So it, it's challenging for sure, Nicole. Yeah, I'm not saying it's it's mm. easy. And but. and equally with the um, more skilled kids as well, particularly if you don't have an assistant coach and you can't yeah. – and it's very hard to kind of keep them engaged when – and it's quite a challenge. I've always found that challenging. Yeah, and and part of it because we have limited access, face to face access, or with the, with our players, is um, giving homework to players. So what I'm saying is there that look, Johnny, you, this is the footwork. You've sort of got it, but you've got to go away, Johnny. And I want you to make 20 left hand layups with this correct footwork you've got every day. Okay, there. So they've got to take some responsibility to to to, to take information away and work on it um and and you know if they you know if they're not doing work between trainings and or have a shooting program or a, a dribbling program and so on like that then obviously the progress is going to be limited you know there so that you know and if if you know the other kid who's already you know light years ahead the gap gets bigger but that's just the reality of it some kids will be have a ball in their hand every day, you know, for, for for an hour or two or more, you know, and they love it and they got it, you know, and that's you know, they just love it where some kids are just well they they like it, but you know, they're not not they've got other interests and, and so on, which is which is fine. But if they if if I pick them, if they're in my team, then I've got a responsibility to coach that kid to the best of my ability every kid in that group, you know, there, but it doesn't mean it's going to be necessarily be equal court time and things like that. You know, we, so we sort of get into another area here around game coaching. That's a, that's a lovely idea in, that's a lovely idea in theory in a perfect world where parents never speak to the coaches, isn't it? Yeah. And, and that's, you know, it won't sort of go too much in that area and it depends on the level, you know, if it's junior JPL, um, you know, there's a, there is an element of high performance with that. If it's Division Five, and most of the kids are there because you know it's it's fun and it's recreation and fitness and social reasons, then sure, the the you know it's going to be probably equal court time, regardless of if you turn up to training and work hard or otherwise. So you know, again, it's a little bit of horses for courses and stuff there. But even if I'm coaching Division Five, I'm going to try and teach that the worst. You know, I just that's my philosophy is that, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got them for an hour or an hour and a half or I'm coaching them in a game. I'm going to try and get the best out of that kid as I can. You know, they, I just feel that we've got that responsibility. I'm, I'm interested that no one's put their hand up about parents. <laughs> Usually that's the number one thing in clinics is how do I manage the parents, you know, there. So that's always an ongoing one and that comes up uh, usually. Uh, in a lot of um, courses and clinics uh, that I've presented and stuff is how do I manage parents and stuff. And so I think, the, the, you know, without going into a lot of detail there, there's different like, is, is being really uh, proactive about your expectations in terms of your communication in pre-season straight away. You know, I've got my group. I One of the first things I would do at first practice or first training would be with the players and the parents or one parent at least and just lay down, this is how I'm running the program. Um, this is how we're going to, this is our focus areas on, you know, we're going to do it. 80% of my trainings will be on fundamental skills, 20% on team concepts. Uh, you know, all things being equal, where all the kids are showing up to training every week and they're working hard and they're being good teammates uh, there, then it'll be roughly equal court time, you know, there. But if you miss training, you know, there, then, then you know, you, you, you're probably uh, not going to get as much uh, court time as some of the other kids that have made that commitment. To me, that's teaching of really good life skills. Um, and I'm sure we can all relate to that to our workplace. Uh, if you don't show up to work enough times, you're fired. <laughs> so, um, I think, you know, it's on us to, to, to communicate uh, appropriate behaviours and what our expect, you know, what your expectations are, 
you know, there. So that you know, we sort of covered that earlier in the setting up your training plan and how you coach in trainings. And But I think being upfront about, you know, what your expectations are and even that to the parents, you know, depending on the age group and the experience of the kids, you know, at the higher age groups, we want the kids you know, communicating to coaches around, look, I've got a school excursion, I can't come to training next week, or I've got an ankle injury, I can't play on Saturday, but I'll come to, to the game and be an assistant coach. You know, we want the kids to communicate these things, not the parents. Unless there's something really high level, um, you know, there then, to me, we're trying to teach the kids that independence and so on there and getting the kids to you know, have that personal responsibility wherever possible. Um, Pete Herrick. Thanks, Phil. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, sort of indicative time, particularly say, you know, for a, a, there's a range of coaches here. Um, so we've got, you know, everyone from 12s all the way up to seniors. Um, so have we, is there any sort of uh, rough idea, say, for 12s or 14s, how much time you should be spending on drills where it's individual skills or shooting and then how much of your time, particularly if you've only got an hour, for example, um, you know, for, for me, I've got, you know, two hours, two sessions a week. I've, I've got a lot of time, but I've still got to fit a lot of things in. But it, it, it's a case of, you know, I still have to fit in things like shooting and dribbling and, you know, individual skills as well as my team based principles and that doesn't matter from 12s 14s all the way up so do we sort of have you know a rough or do you have a rough plan to sort of help the coaches of yeah you should probably be spending you know 20 percent of your time at uh, and roughly of your hour on shooting for example and then you know your team defensive concepts things like that yeah no, that's a good question and it depends a little bit you know the time of year but in the junior level I would be spending, you know, again, it depends on the group um, and their experience and proficiency and so on. But, um, you know, at the senior level where you're at, Pete, it's, I call it top-up work. You know, you can just do three or four minutes of specific dribbling activities and move on, you know, and, and you do a lot of combo drills. So it's passing and dribbling and finishing, shooting, all in the one drill. I think with younger players, you can definitely do that. But when you when you you've definitely got to cover the foundation skills of dribbling, passing, shooting, defensive containment, footwork, uh, and, and pivoting needs to be reinforced at the younger age group. So if I'm, you know, under tens, under twelves, under fourteens, under sixteens, eighty percent of my training is going to be on those on those things. Now, when I say that, it's not going to be on zero necessarily. It's still going to be you know, some some one on one, but in one on one, it might be off a off a lead, um, you know, into a catch and triple threat and playing off the dribble, you know, there. So I'm still working on those foundation skills, but in a in a competitive environment, um, sh shooting's important one and touched on that previously. You know, you've to me, um, you know, an hour is really hard, but I'd be spending you know, um, in layups and shooting activities. Again, I wouldn't just be standing around shooting. It would be full court shooting activities, um, you know, um, and things like advantage, disadvantage drills, which are really fun and they're really good for decision making. So for the uh, coaches that don't know advantage, disadvantage, we talk about two on one. So two offense versus one defense full court or three offense versus two. You know, I would be doing a lot of those activities because I'm working on passing, dribbling, uh, shooting, uh, fast uh, conditioning, decision making. It's fun to do. Uh, the offense have an edge. They have an advantage. So the offense theoretically should be, uh, you know, successful. So that's good for the kids. Um, I'd be doing lots of activities, which is reinforcing those fundamentals through those type of activities uh, there. So 80% of my practice would be re will be drilling and reinforcing foundation skills, you know, including, you know, not just on zero, but competitive stuff. I would not even worry about 
out of bounds plays for those age groups. I mean, in the high performance environment, we would have some half court sets and some baseline and sideline out of bounds plays for sure. But in the club area, I wouldn't, I just teach the kids how to space and how to move off the ball with their leads um, and um, learn how to, to recognize space and attack into space and some of those general offensive principles of the game, you know, penetrate and, and you know, split kick extra is the common terminology, but dribble penetration pass, or penetrate and kick, um, you know, ball reversal and attack. Um, if I've got a big kid, fantastic, playing through the post, fast break concepts, you know, those are all just basic team concepts up to the NBA level. So I would just be doing those things. I wouldn't worry about offensive sets and, and um, you know, man-to-man. -man I wouldn't do any zone, of course, at 14s. You can't. But uh, forget zones. That's not going to help the kids learn the game. I would just be doing man-to-man. -man. I would be trying to pressure up the floor as much as possible, full court, man-to-man, you know, um, maybe I can't do that for the whole game, depending on numbers I've got and the fitness of the kids and, you know, foot speed of the kids, but I'm going to be man-to-man -man and trying to get up the floor and get deflections and, and get into fast break, you know, there, get cheap baskets and so on there. Yeah, look, and some of those drills you mentioned, Phil, like I still use now, advantage, disadvantage, you know, three on two, uh, four four versus, you know, three where a defender, a fourth defender has to chase full court, things like that. So, yeah, yeah. no, I just thought it'd be good for the range of coaches, particularly the ones in the younger groups to see or yeah. at least hear what they should be doing. Like, you know, um, yes, playing a game um, and practicing the game type scenario of a scrimmage at the end of a session is great, but it, it can't be half your session because uh, the kids don't build up those skills. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's one of the, you know, the traps that um, inexperienced coaches can fall into is that, you know, you, you, you get pounded on uh, – Saturday or Friday night or Sunday in your club game, so you add another set play in. But the reality is the kids can't dribble, they can't make a layup, they can't shoot, um, you know. So um, you've, everything can be – even at the senior level, in most cases you can track it back when there's – you know, when you're losing games or you're not, you know, you're not playing at the level you would want to play at or you expect to play at, you can usually track it back 99% um, of the time to poor execution of, of fundamentals or techniques. You know, at the high level, there's a lot of techniques around ball screen defence and so on there. But in the lower levels, it's, you know, the, it's, it's – and that's why, you know, it's, it's the foundation skills. There's really no secrets. So if you want to be a good coach and you can teach fundamentals, you're going to be a good coach. Even if you're not a great game coach, you know, and knowing you know you don't have that experience or that feel for when to call timeouts and make the right subs and and things like that, to me that's secondary. If you can teach the foundation skills of the sport, you're a good coach uh, there, and you're gonna you, you're doing a great service to those to those kids, and to me that's success and so on there. So don't get trapped into the you know I need to run. You know, what the Lakers are running or what, you know, Pete Herrick's running with the Gunners. I need to run plays or I need another out-of-bounds play. That That's a trap inexperienced coaches fall into um, very often, you know, there. So just be aware of that. Um, Nicole, did you have another question? Yeah, sorry. Um, so what are your thoughts? So with small-sided games within training sessions, like, what are your thoughts where you have less training time? Like, I love small-sided games. You can, you know, you can put, you can build so much into them, you know, parts of your offence and, you know, fundamentals that you're working on. But if you have limited time with less skilled players, like, how, how important do you see, like, what are your thoughts on it, on small-sided games when you have less time? Like, should you be, should you be doing that? Can you coach during small-sided games? Yeah, I, I would, you know, like, I mean, you might have to, you might have a, uh, you, you know, if it's three on three, you might want to prescribe 
the type of actions that you that you want initially. So an example of that is if we're playing three out, so we have a point, two wings, so we're spaced out in the half court, three on three, and we're going to initiate the action with a guard to wing pass, and then the the the, the player at the top who is at the point will run a basket cut or a back cut, depending on how the defence defends it. And then the opposite wing's going to run a fill cut in what uh, that's not named after me. That's F I L L. <laughs> they would come to the top, so we balance the floor. And so after that, you can do anything. You know, you might reverse the ball again to the other side, on a, or skip pass to the other side, or they might drive it. You know, from the first catch and just rip it and attack the rim. So you can prescribe the type of actions, and obviously we do that a lot at the higher levels because we're trying to isolate certain things either offensively or defensively we want the players to work on um, there. but So they get lots of reps out of three-on-three, three, both offensively and defensively. And that's why it's really great doing those um, small-sided games because you work both sides of the ball, offense and defense. And then, you know, then I coach on the run, try and minimize the stops when I, when I intervene and I just coach on the run. So if I've got nine players, I'm going to go, uh, you know, uh, uh, three teams of three. You know, so if you've got some reversible bibs, that's advantageous. So we've got a red team, you know, a white team and a green team or whatever, and then we can just rotate that. So why, you know, I can talk to the, the group that's out and give them some feedback and it, everybody's going. It's it's sort of rapid fire, three on three, small sided games. We're reinforcing the foundation skills in a game, somewhat of a game situation. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, anyone else? And again, if you do have other questions and you want to, either my email's there on the slide. Um, and um, more than happy to to um, you know touch base one you know individually with any of you coaches and uh, bounce things around. Um, I hope it's been beneficial. Apologise, I've gone a little bit over uh, there. So, um, but hopefully it's been beneficial to you. Again, thank you very much for giving up your time to to um, come online tonight and. Um, yeah, and hopefully you, you'll you'll come back <laughs> next week. We're going to do shooting, which will be interesting. Um, so I'll do my homework to try and make sure I can present that online in this format. Um, I haven't done a lot of these presentations online. Um, so normally on the courts with clinics and um, coaching courses, but we'll give it a crack um, there. And um, again, thanks very much for your time. Have a good evening. Stay positive in this tough lockdown period and uh, take care of yourself and your loved ones. Thank Thanks, you, Phil. Phil. Appreciate it, mate. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, Phil. You're welcome. Thanks, Phil. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Thanks, Phil.